Hey, what's up everyone? This is Music Tech Help Guy and welcome to part two of my Logic Pro 11 Essentials course. One of the most essential things to know about any digital audio workstation or DAW or DAW for short is how to set up your DAW with an audio interface. Audio interfaces come in a wide variety of sizes, shapes, features, and price points. USB and Thunderbolt audio interfaces are more widely available today than ever, with some devices that cost as little as 50 US dollars and others that cost thousands. The vast majority of audio interfaces serve the same main purposes. They interface audio signals to and from Logic Pro, they route audio coming from Logic to speakers and headphones, they're used to record audio with a microphone, electric guitar, or electric bass into Logic. They serve as an analog to digital or digital to analog converter. And depending on what device you choose, it may also have additional features like MIDI inputs and outputs, additional audio inputs for multi-track recording when you're using lots of microphones, additional audio outputs for routing audio signals out of Logic to your pro audio gear, and some even have built-in DSP processing and effects that can be applied on input while recording. If you are only working with headphones and you don't plan on ever recording any audio, you don't plan on using a microphone or recording vocals, it's totally possible that you could use Logic without an audio interface. However, if you wanna do any kind of audio recording, even with just one microphone for vocals, or you want to connect studio monitors for mixing or set up a home studio like I have, I would highly recommend getting an audio interface of some kind, even if it's a budget one to get you started. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to set up your audio interface with Logic Pro, and we'll also talk about some digital audio fundamentals like IO buffer size and how this affects your latency and recordings and processing, audio file types, bit depth, sample rate, and finally, I'll show you how to test your setup to make sure that Logic Pro is working properly with your audio interface. Before we get started, I need to quickly tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Boombox. Boombox is simply the best platform out there for music storage and collaboration. Whether you're a musician, artist, producer, or mix engineer, Boombox offers a full suite of creative and collaborative tools. Safely store and easily share your mixes, stems, and even full DAW sessions with collaborators worldwide. Receive feedback from your collaborators with time-stamped comments and voice recordings. And you can even manage song splits and generate contracts for your collaborators. Create public or private playlists and establish your unique artist profile to connect with new fans and clients. Leverage the cutting edge Boomba AI, your AI powered co-writer capable of generating chord progressions, MIDI ideas, and assisting with lyrics. And if you don't have Apple Silicon to use the new stem splitter in Logic 11, Boombox has its own stem splitter and vocal remover. If you wanna check out Boombox for yourself, head over to boombox.io today and get four gigabytes of free storage. And if you need more than that, you can upgrade to one of their pro or premium plans. Okay, so to set up your audio interface, you're gonna go up to Logic Pro settings, and then you're gonna to go to audio. And from here, you wanna make sure you're on the devices tab. And what you're looking for here is the output and input device. Now, right now I've got this set to Mac studio speakers for the output device, which means that if I play any audio from Logic, I'm gonna hear it through my Mac studios speakers. And then input device is set to system settings. So that's probably like the built-in microphone um, on your Mac or uh, it might even say none. But when you're working in a DAW like Logic, you want to be able to record from your audio interface and you wanna connect any headphones or studio monitors that you might have to the audio interface as well. So for both of these, I'm going to select my audio interface, which is a Symphony IO Thunderbolt and I'm gonna choose that for both of them. So now all incoming signals will be recorded from the Symphony IO and all outgoing signals will come from the Symphony IO. Next, let's talk about the IO buffer size. So this determines the size of the processing buffer on input and on output. So if you think about this as like processing blocks, generally you would want to use a lower buffer size when you're recording because you're going to be processing smaller chunks or blocks of information 
at a more rapid pace. And so what this will do is it'll minimize any latency or processing delay in the audio signal. Whereas if you're editing or mixing your project and you're not recording anymore, you can pull this up to a higher buffer size. And while this will give you more processing power to run more plugins and effects and instruments and things like that, this will also create a noticeable uh, lag in the signal, a latency in the signal if you try to record with a microphone. So if you try to record with a mic and you have your buffer size set to 1024, you're gonna hear yourself in your headphones, in this case, 46.3 milliseconds later than the input. So this can obviously be kind of a distracting thing. So when you're recording with a microphone and headphones, you always wanna use a lower buffer size, maybe somewhere between 32 and 128. And if you're jumping back and forth between recording and editing, you can try one of these middle values like 128 or 256. This only causes 14.3 milliseconds of round trip latency. So that's basically negligible. Most people can't hear that little bit of latency. Now, when you wanna lock in these settings, you're gonna click apply and we're good to go. Next, I wanna talk about some elements that affect the audio format at which you record. If you're completely new to digital audio fundamentals, that's totally fine. I'll explain in a simple way how these things affect your audio. And also I'll show you that there's no need to really obsess over them either. So the first things I wanna talk about are the file type and bit depth. You can change these by going to the recording settings here, and you'll see we have three different audio file types. So we have AIFF, this is an audio interchange file format, WAVE BWF, this is a broadcast WAVE format, and CAF, which is a core audio format. Now, all three of these file types are uncompressed audio files. So there's not gonna be any difference in quality between the three of these. You're just simply choosing what audio file you want to record to. They're basically interchangeable. While Windows users tend to always use WAVE, Apple users tend to use AIFF and CAF because these are both Apple formats. And you'll find that a lot of Logic's sound library is stored in CAF format. I just like to keep this on WAVE because it's the most universal uncompressed audio file. And then below that, you can select your bit depth. Bit depth has an effect on the floor noise and dynamic range of your audio recordings. So all audio recordings, even digital ones, have a certain threshold of noise, and it's generally very low, so you don't even really hear it. With a 16-bit recording, the noise floor is going to be a bit higher than a recording made at 24 bits. But in terms of audio quality, you're really not gonna hear any difference at all. This really has more to do with the dynamic range between your peak signal level, so the loudest thing that you can record without peaking or clipping, and the noise floor. So with 16-bit, 96 decibels down from peak level is where the noise floor is. And with 24-bit, the noise floor is roughly 144 decibels down from peak level. So I like to think about this concept and the audio file is kind of like a container that you can fill up with information. And with 24 bit, you get a little bit more space inside of that container. So again, you're getting a little more dynamic range between your softest recordings, like barely audible and your loudest recordings. Now you might think that 32 bit flow gives you an even lower noise floor, but that's not really how floating point bit depths work. What this really does is it gives you roughly an extra 6 dB above your peak level. So in case you peak or clip a recording, you can actually normalize that peak down to be below clipping. Now, again, if you're brand new to all of this, you probably have no clue what peaking or clipping is, and that's totally fine. We'll talk about that more later on in the course. Now, unless you have a specific reason to use 16-bit or 32-bit float, I'd highly recommend just operating in 24-bit. And this is a global setting, so this will not change from project to project. So just set it once and never worry about it again. Now, the other important element of digital audio files is the sample rate or sampling rate. Unlike bit depth, which is a global setting, sample rate is set on a project by project basis. So to find this, you're gonna go up to file, project settings, and then you're gonna to go to audio. Here you can change your sample rate 
and you'll see there's six different options here. The options you see here are going to depend on what audio interface you're using. Historically, 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, and 192 kilohertz were used for audio for video applications, which is why I'm on 48K right now because I'm making a screen recording. The others, 44.1, 88.2, and 176.4, were historically used for audio and music recordings. However, these days, these sample rates are pretty much interchangeable. 44.1 is essentially CD quality. Basically, what this means is 44,100 samples are taken per second during the analog to digital conversion process. So when your audio interface converts an audio recording you make with, say, a microphone, that analog audio is being sampled 44,100 times per second to generate a digital audio file. Sample rate does have an effect on the frequency range of your audio recordings. Essentially, you can pick up higher frequencies at higher sample rates. But even at 44.1, the top frequency range is half of the sample rate, so 22,050 hertz, which is well within the normal human hearing range. And it's also worth mentioning that the audible difference between a recording made at 44.1 versus 192 is going to be negligible to your ear because most audio interfaces have anti-aliasing filters, which filter out frequencies above a certain range during the analog to digital conversion process. Although sample rates do have an audible effect on the frequency range of effects processing and audio manipulation like compressing or stretching audio recordings or using flex time. And it's also important to note that all of these higher sample rates will increase your file size for any audio recordings you make. So in a nutshell, 44.1 is totally fine. If you make all of your recordings at 44.1, you'll be just fine. I generally operate at 48 just because I'm always working with video, so I'm gonna leave it on that setting. So again, unless you have a really specific reason for why you would want to use a higher sample rate, I recommend just sticking with 44.1 or 48. In most situations, you're not going to hear a difference. Now, one thing that's really important to remember about your sample rate though, is you do not want to change your sample rate after you've already started recording. You want to choose a sample rate and stick with it throughout the life of that project. Otherwise, you'll end up with audio recordings that play too fast or play too slow because they were recorded at a different sample rate than what the project was set to. Okay, so the last thing we wanna do is test our audio setup. So what I'm gonna do is press O, and this will bring up the loop browser. And I'm just gonna drag in one of these loops. You just click and drag it in below the lowest track, and it'll create its own track here. We can size this up. And then if you're like really zoomed out, you can adjust your horizontal zoom right here. So let's zoom that up a bit. And then with the playhead at the beginning of the project, I'll just press spacebar to play the loop. And then you can press spacebar again to stop playback. So with your headphones or your speakers, your studio monitors plugged into your audio interface, you should be able to hear that audio coming through your audio interface, not coming from the Mac itself. And to return the playhead back to the beginning, you can just press the return key. So right now I'm hearing this loop through my studio monitors that are hooked up to my audio interface. Okay, so we've tested the output. Let's test the input. So I'm just gonna select these tracks and delete them just by pressing the delete key. This will bring up the new track dialog again. This time I'm gonna create an audio track. I'll choose mic or line. And then I'm going to plug in a microphone into my audio interface. Actually, I've already done that. The microphone you're hearing right now uh, for my voiceover is plugged into input one on my Symphony I.O. So right here under audio input, that's where you can select the input that you've plugged your microphone into. So I'm going to choose input one. Then I'll just click create. I'll size up this track. I'll set the playhead back to the beginning by pressing return. And what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm going to mute the track and I'm gonna click this R button. This is record enable. Now, the reason why I've muted the track is because I don't want to hear myself in the recording as I'm recording. If you have your studio monitors on and you have this unmuted, you'll end up getting like a feedback loop between your microphone and your speakers. 
So if you have headphones on and your studio monitors turned off, you can then unmute the track and you can hear yourself through Logic back into your headphones. I'm also going to come up here to these two icons. This one will likely be on. Just click on it to turn it off. That's your count in. And then this is your metronome. Click and hold. And then it's probably by default going to be on click while recording. I just like to click and hold and turn that off so I don't hear any click track, any metronome in the background as I make my test recording. I'll go ahead and close out the loop browser. And then to record, I'll just click this button right here and I'll say a few words to test. Check, check, testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. This is a test recording in Logic Pro 11. Then press spacebar to stop recording. I can zoom out here, hit return to set the playhead back to the beginning. I'll turn off record enable, turn off mute, and then press spacebar to play back my test recording. Check, check, testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. This is a test recording in Logic Pro 11. Now, if you're not getting any waveform here, like you're not getting any signal uh, from your microphone while recording, check the microphone gain level on your audio interface and pull that up a bit. And if you're using a condenser microphone, make sure to turn on phantom power. This is the plus 48 V switch or button on your device. And watch out because sometimes it can be software controlled with my symphony control panel. This is where I can turn on or turn off my phantom power. Now channel one on the microphone I'm using doesn't need phantom power, um, so I don't have that option turned on there. But just be aware that the phantom power control for each channel may be inside the software for your audio interface. Okay, so I've set up my audio interface. I've tested my output and input. In the next video, we'll move on to an overview of the Logic Pro 11 user interface, and we'll also talk a bit more about playback controls. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to see more content like this. As always, thank you so much for the support, and thanks for watching.